are you still on the conference call? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So first of all, thank you all for, for showing up. It's great to see so many interested in my in my research. <laughs> on the image behind me, you see a 3D point cloud gathered with a lidar sensor, and it's this one actually, and it's gathered in an agricultural grass field. And if we zoom in a bit, you can see that at this specific point in time, there's a human standing in front of the tractor, and the tractor or the driver needs to react in order to avoid an accident. So he needs to detect the obstacle and avoid it. My PhD is titled Lighter Based Obstacle Detection and Prevention for Autonomous Agricultural Vehicles. And it's all about ensuring safety in uh, of it's ensuring safety for self-driving farming vehicles. So if we want to remove the human from the loop, we need to make sure that the system detects all obstacles and acts accordingly to increase or to optimize safety. You're probably all familiar with self-driving cars. So large car manufacturers trying to milk to, to make self-driving cars drive on roads. Uh, this is the recent the most recent version from the Google company Waymo, in which they have a number of sensors on the roof, they have a LiDAR similar to mine, they have cameras and radar, and they use all these sensors for detecting objects in the environment. Here you see a promotional video from Google, uh, from Waymo, in which they show some of the objects that they are able to detect. And they can detect cyclists, vehicles, pedestrians, uh, lane markings, traffic signs, traffic lights, it's very comprehensive. And for all these objects, they also predict uh, the behavior into the future. So it's quite a complex task. This is the equivalent in agriculture. There are no lane markings, there are no traffic signs, no traffic lights. Most of the time, there are no objects. But it could still happen that in front of the vehicle, there's something uh, there. In this case, a small child playing in the ground or playing in the grass, and of course we need to detect him and avoid him. So <laughs> while <laughs> and we did, <laughs> uh, and while this is a much more simple environment, uh, there are actually some additional challenges because if we look at the road out here, we can basically say that everything, anything that uh, that is not flat, not planar, is an object and something we need to avoid. Whereas in up in, in, in an agricultural field, a grass field, there may be high grass or high crop that we would actually, actually like to, to cut and to drive into. Whereas some objects may be hidden within this vegetation and may be obscured by it, and we need to detect those. So there are some additional challenges, although it's quite uh, more a simple case. So my PhD project has been part of a project called SAFE which is uh, an abbreviation for Safer Autonomous Farming Equipment. And it is concerned uh, making uh, safe uh, self-driving farming vehicles. So that could either be traditional tractors or it could be a smaller robot. In both cases, the vehicles need to perceive the environment, they need to detect obstacles and recognize them, and they need to then plan what to do. Should we stop the vehicle or should we move around the obstacle? and in the end control it uh, so that it actually performs these commands. My PhD however has only focused on perception, so I'm only looking at detecting and recognizing obstacles. Then some of the other project partners have looked at planning and control. And to narrow it down even further, I have focused on the LiDAR sensor, Yeah. so this one. Uh, and LiDAR is an acronym for Light Detection and Ranging, and it uses laser pulses uh, that it emits and then measures the distance to the object by measuring the reflectance. And it does this with, in this case, 32 laser beams that are then rotating around 10 times per second, generating point clouds. And each of these point clouds, which is 3D measurement, you can say, uh, consists of 70,000 points and we get 10 of these per second. So it's quite comprehensive. Here I have shown a single of these point clouds overlaid onto a drone image. And you can see all the white points are the measurements from the LiDAR sensor. In this case, most of them will just hit the grass and represent 
the ground in this case, which is free to, to, to drive. Whereas there are actually some of the measurements that hit this human walking in front of the tractor. And my task, the end goal here, is to make sure that we detect this obstacle and uh, regard it in this case as a human. So I have formulated two research questions. The first one is how can obstacles be recognized in sparse 3D point clouds from a rotating multi-beam LiDAR? In other words, how can we detect obstacles using just this LiDAR sensor? The second one is how can LiDAR technology cooperate with other sensing modalities in agricultural environments to increase object recognition performance? In other words, how can we combine the LiDAR sensor with cameras and radars, other sensors, to increase the detection performance and recognition performance, and also uh, the robustness of the system. And to answer these questions, I have looked at three major tasks during my research. The first one, and that's also what I'd like to present today, basically. The first one is called point cloud classification, and it deals with taking as input a raw point cloud, this 3D point cloud that we have shown over here, and then for each point, a point assign an object label, so saying whether this point belongs to the ground, or whether it represents an object, or it, if it's part of the vegetation, trees and bushes, for instance. So that's what you see over here, um, described by the colors. Next, I've looked at multimodal fusion, and that answers the second research question. So how can we fuse or combine the 3D point cloud from LiDAR with color images, thermal images, etc., to hopefully correct some of the mistakes that, mistakes that we made up here. Because simply from geometric information, which is provided by uh, the LiDAR sensor, it may be difficult to actually distinguish what protrudes from the ground. Is it vegetation? Is it an, obst or is it an object? That, <clears throat> sorry, that may be difficult. Whereas if we combine that with color information and thermal information, we may actually be able to correct some of the mistakes. That's the idea about uh, multimodal fusion. Then in the end, I'll talk about obstacle mapping, which goes from a local representation in the, sorry, in the LiDAR frame or in the camera, in the pixel coordinates, to a global representation of the map uh, or of the environment as a map. And a map like this, we can then use, uh, or the vehicle can then use to navigate in. So, but, but in order to, to um, develop all these methods, train them and test them, they are all data driven. So we need a lot of data acquired in an agricultural environment. And that's what I'd like to start talking about. So how did we actually collect a lot of data that we could use for training and <coughs> testing the methods? And for that, we have ourselves developed a super sensor kit, we call it a platform with multiple sensing modalities. Uh, and during my research day in Australia, I have used a similar platform called TRIM. On our own, we have the LiDAR sensor, and we have different cameras and a radar and localization, uh, a localization system. The same goes for the shrimp robotic platform. It has some of the same sensors. But I'd really like to dive into our own platform and show you some data examples. So here we see the platform again, and here we see some different videos that I'd like to show you. The first one is a simple web camera. So it records color images, and these can be used for detecting and recognizing uh, objects, for instance, humans in images. Um, it's very good for that. The second one is the stereo camera. Again, it provides color information, and in addition, it provides depth information that we could use at estimating the distance to these objects. Then down here, we have a thermal camera, which detects heat radiation, so we can use that for uh, finding objects that are warmer than the background, for instance, these humans. Then over here, we have a 360 degree camera. It can see in front of the tractor, but also behind it. And that's relevant if we combine that with LiDAR, because the LiDAR sensor can also see uh, 360 degrees around the vehicle, uh, but measures geometric information instead. 
And finally, down here, we have a still image of uh, the radar detections. The radar is able to detect some of the same things. We have some humans that it detects, and of course it detects the tractor, which is made of metal. Finally, we have GPS and IMU sensors that can be used for localization, so that we know at all points in time where is the platform located and uh, how is it oriented globally. So these are all the different modalities that we have recorded for all of our field trials. And we have collected seven different data sets here in Denmark, uh, distributed around Denmark, mainly of grass fields, also a few row crops, and we had various obstacles in, in all of these uh, data sets. I'd like for now just to dive into the sixth of these, which is the most comprehensive one, which we call field safe. And here you, show, uh, here you see some, some uh, drone uh, footage from the recording. As you can see, we have placed a number of objects in the field beforehand, and we then recorded these while driving around. So, we had some human mannequin dolls, stationary objects, uh, a barrel and a small vehicle, and a lot of other obstacles. And we then also had a session where we had four human test subjects walking around in random patterns to have also to include also dynamic obstacles, some obstacles that move around. And the difficult thing here is actually not to record this data. The difficult thing is to obtain ground truth information that we can use to train our algorithms and test them. So we need to know at all points in time during this, during this uh, recording where were the obstacles placed and which obstacles types uh, were they. And in order to get that, we started before cutting the field uh, by flying over the field with a mapping drone. And we then stitched all the images together to form this top-down image of the grass field. And this is extremely high resolution, so we can zoom into a specific part here and recognize that it's the human mannequin doll that we placed at this position. And we also have a correspondence between pixel coordinates and GPS coordinates, so global coordinates. We then manually annotated this off the photo, and so that we, for each pixel, each location, can say whether that was the ground, grass, vegetation, a human mannequin doll, uh, or, or the other objects. So now we have ground truth information of all the static obstacles. <coughs> but there were also these people walking around, and in order to obtain ground truth, uh, ground truth positions of these, we had another drone hovering 70 meters above the field, recording both the tractor and also the people walking around. And by then, having a number of markers that we knew the uh, exact location of, we could stabilize the video, uh, transform it to view it directly from above, and synchronize it with the recordings from the tractor, so that we ended up with this. We could now manually annotate the locations of these humans so that we ended up with a map where we had ground truth, positions, and object classes of all static and dynamic obstacles. So, the contributions of this work is that we have published a journal paper in Census, where we have described our data set and the data platform, we have, uh, which consists of multimodal sensor data, which was also calibrated and synchronized, we have both static and dynamic ground truth information, and we have made it publicly available on our, on our website so that others in the community can download it and use it in future research. Now we have the data, and we have ground truth annotations. Now we can look at the first of these tasks called point cloud classification. And the task, again, is to, for each point in the point cloud, assign an object label, does it represent a ground, vegetation, or an object? And for this, uh, the traditional approach for doing this is to look for each point in, uh, around the local neighborhood, compute based on this local neighborhood of points a number of statistics. For instance, the height of these points, the shape, the orientation, and using these uh, statistics we can apply, train a classifier, and make it predict whether this point in the middle belongs to the object, vegetation, or ground, for instance. This works very, very well for dense point clouds. 
but as you can see, if I move this neighborhood around, which is a constant size, when we move further away from the sensor at this distance, there are not that many points. And in this case, we can see that the local neighborhood actually only captures uh, a single of these laser beams. And based on this information that we have here, this line of points, it's impossible to say whether that represents the ground or whether it's part of an object or vegetation. So the first work that I did was to propose a varying neighborhood size. So that when we are close to the sensor, we use a small neighborhood because we have many points, whereas when we move further away, we gradually increase the neighborhood size so that even at far distances, we have points from multiple beams and can thus estimate some coarse features. This represents a very traditional pipeline for viewing point classification. We extract some handcrafted features, some features that I designed myself, and we then apply a classifier to predict the object, uh, the, the, the class for each point. Another recent trend uh, within machine learning and computer vision is deep learning. And the great thing about deep learning is that it learns the features of itself, so we don't have to handcraft them, and it does this in a hierarchical fashion. So it doesn't only use a small, single, small neighborhood. You can say that it gradually increases the neighborhood to incorporate multiple levels of a hierarchy of features. And this works really well for images. Um, actually, a few, few years ago, the best deep learning network surpassed human performance for object recognition in images. So the, the computer is better at recognizing objects than we human are, humans are. For point clouds, however, it's not that obvious to how to apply these networks. Because if we look at a single point here, it's not that well defined what other points are its neighbors. And uh, it doesn't fit into a grid, which we usually assume with deep learning. But we can come up with another data representation, for instance, a range image, where what you see down here, the image down here, represents exactly the same information as is contained up here. Now, uh, the, so the image down here is, uh, has a height of 32 pixels, corresponding to the 32 different beams, laser beams, and the width here corresponds to a 360 degree uh, rotation. So it's exactly the same information, the intensities now describe the depth or the distance from the sensor to the object, and you can see some correspondences. We have the tractor here in the point cloud, that's down here in the image. We have some people walking around here, they are here in the image, etc. etc. So it's exactly the same information, now it's just contained as an image, and we can use modern state-of-the-art deep learning approaches for 2D. So we have the range image, and we actually also have another channel called intensity. For each measurement with the LiDAR, the laser, we also get a reflectance intensity, describing, among other things, the material that, is, that it is reflected of. And that might also serve relevant for classifying what the point belongs to. Not so great thing about deep learning, or the downside, you might say, is that it requires a tremendous amount of training data, of labeled or annotated data examples. In order to obtain that, I used the field safe data set that I described just before, and I dereferenced all my points. So for each point, in all the point cards, I assigned that its GPS position. Once I did that, I could then put them all together in a common map, as you see here, and I could use the drone annotations, as I described before, overlay them onto the point cloud, take the colors or the object labels from the annotated drone image, and color the point cloud by those. Then I actually have a ground truth uh, ground truth information of all the points in all my point clouds. And that's what I used for training the network. So if we look at a specific point in time when the uh, tractor was here, we have the range image from before, we can then look up the labels in the map and have them represented as an image as well. So now we have a corresponding pair of input to our network, to our algorithm, and what we would like it to output. And as you can see, I have masked out the tractor and the platform because I don't want the network to learn those things. 
the downside, uh, this is only preliminary work, I haven't completely finished this work. The downside is that I only have to data from a single field, ground truth data from a single field. So in this case, I split the field into a green section, which I use for training, a blue section that I use for validating it, and a uh, red section that I use for testing the algorithm. It's not the ideal approach, and uh, in future work, I will have to apply it on a completely different field that the algorithm has never seen before. But using examples of input images, range image, and what we would like it to output, we can now train a deep neural network. And in this case, I have used a state-of-the-art uh, deep network called DenseNet, or actually an extension of DenseNet that performs semantic segmentation. That is, for each pixel, we assign a class label. And the idea here is that we input the image up here, we then apply a number of convolutional layers to extract features, we then downsample the representation, and this continuous downsampling provides us with multiple levels of features, the hierarchy of features. And we do that a number of times, I haven't shown all of them, uh, in, in the downsampling part here. Then there's an upsampling part where we combine all the information that we have extracted so far. So we take, on, on a small scale here, uh, the features, combine them with the next scale, etc., etc., so that when we end up, at the end of the network, we have information from all uh, abstraction levels, you can say, which is necessary for the network to learn how to predict the object labels. So, here you have a ground truth uh, point cloud, uh, which is colored by different classes, so you have grass, here as green, blue represents vegetation, and this uh, lilac here represents uh, a human. This is the ground truth. This is a prediction of the network. So you can see, if I go back, most of the grass and most of the vegetation is actually classified correctly. Whereas some of the other categories are not that well predicted. And that's because we don't have that many examples of these. We have grass all over the field, vegetation all over the field, but there were only four human mannequin dolls. So we don't have that many examples of these objects. That you can also see here. On the other part, we have results for deep learning. So the method that I just presented, uh, or that I just presented. And on the lower part, we have the traditional pipeline that I described before, applied on the same data set. And here you can see that, well first you can see that deep learning performs a bit better than the traditional pipeline. And this is uh, a metric called mean intersection of the union. However, both of them are not that ideal. They should ideally be one, these metrics here. Uh, and you can see the reason for that is that humans are not at all predicted that well. And um, so goes for buildings. And again, this is because there are so few examples uh, that's at least my hypothesis. Uh, so if we had more examples, this would hopefully perform better. Another trend that you can see here is that if we only have range information, so only this range image, we get 36% uh, mean intersection of a union. Whereas if we introduce also the intensity channel, we <coughs> increase the metric by 7%. Whereas, if we look at the tra tra uh, traditional pipeline, it's actually not increased that much. So there's a huge difference in how the two methods can actually utilize these intensities. And my hypothesis here is that the intensities, the lasers, are not that well calibrated. The traditional method is not able to um, circumvent that, whereas deep learning can actually learn that relationship and calibrate the sensor itself. So, the contributions of point cloud classification is that I proposed two methods for classifying sparse point clouds. I have proposed a method for annotating for a semi-automated annotation procedure, so gaining a large annotated data set. And I proposed this semantic segmentation on range images, so how to classify point clouds with deep learning. Now we move on to the second task, which is called multimodal fusion. So how can we combine the LiDAR sensor with the other cameras in this case? And here I have proposed three different methods for combining LiDAR information with camera images. 
I won't go into detail with all of them, but I'd like to talk about the second one, which is called Light Up Camera Fusion with Conditional Random Fields. And here you see an overview of the method that, uh, that I have proposed. On the left side, you have raw input data from the LiDAR, which is a raw point cloud, and you have a raw image from the camera. We then perform an initial classification for each modality in here, where we use only free information to come up with a prediction for each point, a probability that it belongs to an object or whether it belongs to the ground, etc. We do the same thing for the image, so for each pixel, we have an initial classifier that predicts for each, yeah, for each pixel the probability that it belongs to one of these classes. We can then take the 3D information and project it into 2D. And that's shown over here. We can take the 3D points, project them into the image, so that we have a correspondence between a point and a pixel. We know they represent the same structure. And by doing that, we can now fuse the information. We can now combine the two modalities. And for that, I use a conditional random field that I can train to optimally combine the information which is contained in both modalities. The outcome is a point cloud, which is classified for each point, and an image, which is classified for each pixel. The initial 2D classifier uh, first divides the pixel, no, sorry, the image into a number of superpixels, and then for each superpixel, this is a superpixel, then it computes a number of features. And I train a classifier for uh, a uh, support vector machine with probability estimates to describe for each superpixel what is the probability that, in this case, it belongs to an object. <coughs> and so for the other classes as well. The same goes for 3D. Here I use the traditional pipeline that I described before to, for each point, describe what is the probability that it belongs to an object. We also subdivide the point cloud into a number of 3D super voxels or 3D segments that we can then overlay using the 3D to 2D projection onto the image. So here you basically have all the information. You have 2D super pixels, 3D super voxels overlaid so that you can see in this area both modalities can see the environment. And once we have that, we can now combine the information. For that, I have applied a conditional random field. So I constructed first an undirected graphical model, that's what you see here, which consists of all these different paths. So the circles are called 2D nodes, and the circles correspond, the 2D nodes describe superpixels. So this is a 2D node, whereas 3D nodes, those are the, uh, the orange rectangles, they describe 3D segments. And we try to classify or predict both 2D segments and 3D segments at the same time. Then we have 2D edges, and 2D edges connect superpixels. So if you look at a single superpixel, it has a number of neighbors, and these will be connected in the graph with these green edges. The same goes for 3D edges, they connect neighboring supervoxels in the graph. Then we have 2D 3D edges, those are the red edges in the graph here, and they connect the two modalities. So if you look at a 3D segment over here, it will overlap with one or more 2D segments in the image. And the ones that it overlap with, it will be connected with, with uh, red uh, lines in this case. <coughs> and to complicate it even further, we also have temporal edges. Because if we look at the image before, it represents a single point in time. But if we detect a human in front of us now and move a bit forward, it's very likely that he will just still be there. And we would like to model this. We would like to come up with consistent predictions over time. Therefore, I introduce the temporal edges. <coughs> a conditional random field is described as this conditional probability distribution. So it's P of X given C, where X denotes the assignment of class labels to all the 2D and 3D segments. And C here denotes the features. So these are the initial classifications from 3D and 2D, respectively. And our goal is to come up with the most likely sequence of labels to our nodes, given the measurements. 
And this is an optimization problem. We want to find the most likely sequence that corresponds to minimizing this energy term with respect to the x here. And the energy term can be described as a sum of potentials. They correspond, the colors correspond here. So we have 2D, or sorry, uh, unary potentials in the beginning, and then a number of pairwise potentials for all the edges. So, I'll go briefly through them. The 2D node up here has a potential which is basically just the initial prediction from the initial classifier. So it's the probabilities for each superpixel that it belongs to one of the object classes. The same goes for 3D, it's just superboxes now. Then we have 2D edges, and now we are looking at uh, two neighboring superpixels. So one superpixel here and one here, for instance, and the potential really describes the cost of assigning these with different labels. And this cost depends on the average colors. So II here denotes the mean color of this segment, IJ denotes the mean color of the other one. If they are very similar, the two segments, the colors of the two segments, there's a high cost of assigning them with different labels because it's very unlikely that they represent different objects. Whereas if they are very different, that's a low cost. Same thing goes for 3D. We don't have colors anymore, but now we look at surface normals. So if the surface normals point in the same direction, there's a high cost for inferring or assigning them with different class labels, and vice versa. And then we have 2D, 3D edges. I won't go into the math, but basically it describes the area of overlap. So we have an overlap between a 2D, 2D superpixel and a 3D segment, and if they, uh, there's a huge overlap, then there's a high cost of assigning different labels, because they physically represent the same object, or the same structure. And finally, the temporal edges. If you imagine that this is a point cloud acquired at time t minus 1, then if we move forward a bit and take a new point cloud, and use our localization system to align them, we can have at this <coughs> position uh, a point from the previous frame, which is white, and a point from the current frame, oh, the other way around, sorry. The, the potential now depends on the distance between these. So if we have two points in different frames that are located very close to each other, we will have a high cost for assigning them with different class labels, and vice versa. So, if we look at the results, we can see on the upper part here where I have the 2D results. So this is per pixel uh, accuracy um, for the method, and this is evaluated per point in the point cloud. And we can see for the uppermost uh, row that these are the initial results from the initial 2D classifier. So using only 2D information, these are the results. We can then see, and simulate for 3D down here, we can then see when we introduce more information into our conditional random field, when we introduce more edges, the results are gradually increased, and we can see the best performance is obtained once we include all the edges. <coughs> so when we have both spatial, temporal, and multimodal links in our conditional random field. So basically, this describes that it's better to use two sensors than just one. We can gain something from this fusion. And you can also look at it visually, where you see an input image up here, an input point cloud down, down here, and here we have the initial classification results. So for each pixel, we have determined whether it belongs to one of four classes, and the same for 3D. And over here, we have the results after including all the edges, all the information that we have. And there are some differences. If we look here at the person standing in front of the vehicle, we can see that he's partly misclassified as vegetation using only 3D information, but once we combine that with 2D, it's actually corrected so that we can see it's an object. The same thing goes for 2D. We can see that the, the part here behind the trailer is misclassified as an object, but after fusing with 3D, that's corrected so that we can see that it's actually not an, an object. So, these are the contributions of multimodal fusion. I have introduced spatial, temporal, and multimodal links in this publication. 
I have evaluated on it on a comprehensive data set that I have evaluated on different orchards, including mangoes, lychees, apples, almonds, and a dairy field. And I can see that the, the method actually tra transfers from one domain into a completely new and unseen domain quite well. And finally, I've also made this data set that I used publicly available together with the people at, in Australia so that others can download the data set and my annotations and use it in future research. So, finally, to the last part, obstacle mapping. And again, this concerns going from a local representation in the sensor frames to a global representation as a map that the vehicle can then use to navigate it. And this is some work that I've done together with my colleague, Beatrice Jansen, from here, and a German PhD student called Timo Kortens. And we have together proposed an architecture uh, describing all the parts necessary for doing this. So first, we have a sensor platform. I've already described that. That's a super sensor kit with all the different modalities. And then we propose an inverse sensor model for each sensor. And an inverse sensor model actually describes a top-down view of its local neighborhood uh, where the sensor can provide some information of, uh, of uh, if, whether the neighborhood is free to traverse or if it's occupied by some obstacle. And in this case, I have shown you the LiDAR inverse sensor model. We can then fuse that information so first use the localization so that we know where in the map was it placed, fuse the information, the occupancy grid maps from all the different sensors and come up with a combined map. And this map shows where, is, where do we have vegetation. Then we have another map describing where do we have humans and where do we have grass, etc. We can then, at runtime, look up in this map in front of the vehicle and decode the, the immediate trajectory in front, in front of the vehicle. And that's a part that uh, Timo Courthouse has been uh, involved in. So looking at, is there anything that we need to avoid in front of the vehicle? So now we are getting close to actually uh, planning how to, to, to drive forward. So I'll just have a brief view at these inverse sensor models. The first one is the traditional pipeline that I've talked about a few times already for the point cloud. The second one is for the radar, and here I have applied a simple tracking method so to remove uh, a lot of noisy measurements. So here we can see it's overlaid <coughs> onto the point cloud. Here we can see that the radar, that's all the circles, it detects some of the humans, and it, of course, detects the tractor down here. Then my colleague Peter has worked with uh, images, and in this case, we threshold the thermal image so that we can detect some of the warmer objects. He has also applied a state-of-the-art object detector called YOLO on the images, and as you can see, it's able to detect with bounding boxes some of the humans in this case. He has also developed his own method for anomaly detection. So here we detect everything that, sh that looks abnormal, everything that shouldn't be there in the field. And finally, he has applied a semantical segmentation network in which for each pixel we know, or well, it predicts the object class for that <coughs> pixel. And that has all been combined and mapped, and we then have results for the static case, uh, which I'd like to share. So now we're looking at all these static obstacles that were out there, and they are divided into different categories. I'd like to just look at the vulnerable obstacles that represent humans. So, the upper part here. If we apply just the YOLO detector on the image, we get a map looking like this. And in this map, we are able to detect three of the four mannequin dolls. However, if we fuse that, that's the second row up here, with information from the other algorithms using still only a camera image, we can actually, with Bayesian fusion, come up with a better prediction so that we uh, detect all four mannequin dolls. So this shows that we can actually also fuse information within the same sensor with different algorithms and obtain a better result. And then once we fuse all the sensors, we can see that over here we have single sensor performances, here we have fused across different algorithms, and finally we have fused across the sensors. 
and the results increase gradually. So adding more sensors introduces more information and it improves our detection results. That's the main outcome of this work. And the contributions are that we have just recently uh, published a journal paper in Frontiers in Robotics and AI, where we propose this architecture consisting of detection methods, fusing me mechanisms, global mapping, and the path decoding along the actual runtime trajectory of the vehicle. And finally, we have evaluated that on a public multimodal data set, namely our field safe data set. So, to summarize my contributions, here are listed some of the papers that I've published during my research or during my PhD. The first three deal with data sets, data collection. So we've described our platform, we've described our data sets, and the most recent one is the field safe data set where we also made the data publicly available. Then I have two papers concerning point cloud classification. The first one uh, is the traditional pipeline, and the second one is the most recent work, the prelim preliminary work that I've done on deep learning. Then I have three of them that deal with multimodal fusion, so combining different modalities. Here I talk a lot about the last one here, which is the conditional random field fusion. And lastly, together with my colleague Peter and Timo, I have worked on obstacle mapping, so going from a local representation to a global representation, fusing information and uh, decoding along the trajectory. So, to conclude, the first research question, how can obstacles be recognized in sparse 3D point clouds from a rotating multi-beam LIDAR? And to answer that question, I have proposed two methods, traditional pipeline and deep learning. And in my point of view, deep learning is the most promising technology. I think it could, the method itself is actually quite good, but it could of course be improved with a lot more training data from other environments, which would then help uh, increase the results. The second question, how can LIDAR technology cooperate with other sensing modalities in agricultural environments to increase object recognition performance? And to answer that, I have proposed three different methods for LIDAR camera fusion and our work with, with Peter and Timo on obstacle mapping where we fuse modalities and map them globally. Then, concerning the data sets, I have published two data sets made them publicly available, the field safe data set, as I've already described, and the Australian data set called here the shrimp data set, so that others in the community can continue on our work and uh, you know, do research in this domain in the future. Finally, to answer a question you might all have, uh, is it fully autonomous? Have I made a self-driving tractor? And unfortunately the answer is no. I've only looked at perception, so only looked at how to detect and recognize obstacles. There's, of course, also planning and control that are important tasks for, for self-driving vehicle. But I have shown that some of the methods in other fields that we use can be transferred to the agricultural domain with success, although there are still some challenges, new challenges involved. And more importantly, I've shown that we can combine different sensor modalities to increase the object detection performance to better detect and recognize objects, and perhaps more importantly, to provide some robustness so that we don't trust a single sensor, as we have seen lately, could be a problem for companies like Tesla and Uber. Thanks for listening.